The subject of my message is baptism and fullness. In each case, I'm referring to the Holy Spirit. I want to speak to you tonight about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And I want to draw a definite scriptural distinction between these two things. Many, many times, and I have done it myself probably as often as others, we have said without further consideration of a person who's been baptized in the Holy Spirit, he has been filled with the Holy Spirit. But when we look at the New Testament, it does not present to us exactly that picture. Now, I'm going to seek to base my message this evening solely and entirely on the Word of God, the New Testament. If you care to analyze the New Testament, you'll find that these two phrases together are used precisely 21 times in the New Testament. That is, on the one hand, the phrase to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and on the other hand, phrases such as to be filled with the Holy Spirit or to be full of the Holy Spirit. Count the total number of times that they occur, thank you so much, and you will find that it is 21. That's interesting because 7 is distinctively the number of the Holy Spirit, and 21 is 3 times 7. Furthermore, if you break it up, you'll find that the phrase to be baptized in the Holy Spirit occurs seven times, and phrases such as to be filled with the Holy Spirit occur 14 times. One is 1 times 7, and the other is 2 times 7. And there's only one place where they actually coincide out of those 21 occasions. There's another place where we may deduce that they coincide. Since this is possibly new, the thought may not have occurred to some of you before, I will briefly and quickly mention to you the 14 places where this New Testament speaks of being filled with or full of the Holy Spirit. There are three distinct Greek words that are used. Two are verbs and one is an adjective. There is the verb pletho, which is used. These are the places where it's used, meaning to fill. Luke 1.15, it's referred, it's used of John the Baptist. He's to be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Luke 1.41, it's used of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. She was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. Luke 1.47, it's used of Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. He was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. Then Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, it refers to the events of the day of Pentecost. The disciples in the upper room, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Acts 4 and verse 8, it's used to Peter, preaching to the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. Peter being filled with the Holy Ghost, looked at them and spoke to them. Acts 4, 31, it's used again in that chapter. After the disciples had met together and prayed, it says the place was shaken where they had prayed and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. Acts 9, verse 17, Ananias was sent to Saul of Tarsus in the city of Damascus and was told to lay his hands on him and pray for him that he might receive his sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. In Acts 13, verse 9, the next person referred to in that connection is Paul the Apostle when he was dealing with Elamas the sorcerer. It says, Paul, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked at him and pronounced the judgment of God upon him and blindness came upon that man immediately. And then there's the verb pleroo, which has the meaning of being full, or being filled, and is used only once in Ephesians 5, 18, be ye continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And then there is the adjective flares, which is used of certain people. Perhaps enough, the first person of whom it is ever used is the Lord Jesus Christ. In Luke 4, verse 1, after his baptism by John in Jordan, Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, was led up into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. A lot of people wouldn't imagine that that would be the first thing after you become full of the Holy Spirit, would they? A face-to-face and head-on encounter with Satan lasting 40 days. A lot of people that imagine that being filled with the Holy Spirit would immediately lead to some glorious, uplifting experience. Acts 6 and verse 3, it refers to the men who are fit to be deacons, men of good report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And they had to look out in the early church to find them. You notice that? They weren't growing on every tree. In Acts 6, 5, it's used as the first man mentioned in that list of deacons, of Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. 
In Acts 7.55, it's used to Stephen again in the moment of martyrdom. Being full of the Holy Ghost, he looked up to heaven and saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And in Acts 11.24, it's used of another man of rather similar character, Barnabas, a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and power. Totally 14 references. And I believe that if you were to analyze those for yourself, you would see that we have a, a reason to say that a person cannot be filled with or full of the Holy Ghost without making a very definite and positive impact in some way for God. On the other hand, let me say this frankly, I know plenty of people that have been baptized in the Holy Ghost, spoken with other tongues, whose lives scarcely count for God at all. That's the fact. And every Pentecostal minister will have to acknowledge that fact. One of the facts that troubled me over the period of my ministry over a good many years, one of the things that led me to this study which I'm seeking to present to you this evening, that I said to, I said to people, well, these people have been filled with the Holy Ghost. And Presbyterians and other people said, well, if they're filled with the Holy Ghost, why doesn't it show? And you know I didn't know the answer. And I knew they had a point. And one thing I seek to do is to face the truth. Jesus said, the truth shall make you free. We dodge the truth. We have little hope of getting anywhere with God. All right. Now I'll, I'll ask the question. What then? I said there was one place where they coincided. You notice that? That was Acts 2 and verse 4. On the day of Pentecost, we know from the words of Jesus, because he said to them a little earlier, John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And we know for sure that took place in the day of Pentecost. That was the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And it says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues. We read of other people that were baptized in the Holy Ghost, definitely stated the house of Cornelius, the disciples of Ephesus. Scripture does not say they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Actually, if you pause and consider for a moment, it's almost impossible to believe that exactly the same results were produced in those 120 disciples in the upper room as were produced in the house of Cornelius where a group of people were gathered who were pagans and had never once heard the gospel message before that moment. Whereas the people in the upper room had been disciples and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ personally on earth for three and a half years. They had witnessed his death, resurrection, and ascension. And they had spent ten days together in prayer waiting upon God. What then is the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I would like to take one text which I believe helps us to understand this, that's 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into or of one Spirit. Now I'd like to try and change this translation just a little. Having studied Greek and taught Greek for a number of years, I venture to say that this is a more correct translation and you can check it with any of the various versions that are more literal. The preposition by is a disaster. Most unfortunate disaster, because it isn't there in the Greek, the Greek says in. And I know men that have built a whole series of doctrines on this one word by. And if they'd have just gone to a more literal translation, they couldn't have ever started to build those doctrines. In one spirit, it says, we were all baptized. Not we are. The difference in tense is this. If I say the door was shut yesterday, I don't tell you anything about what the door is today. But if I say the door has been shut, it means and it is shut now. And the scripture does not say we have been now all baptized and therefore are now baptized, but it says we all were at one certain period baptized. The difference. And we have all been made to drink of one spirit, been given to drink of one spirit. There we find that two particular phrases are used, and I believe these together present the two aspects of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. One word is baptized, and the other word is drink. Now, the word baptized, without any question whatever, and I was at Cambridge University towards the close of last year, the place where I studied and took my degrees. I went back there, and I spent a day with all the books that were available to me, carefully researching into the actual meaning of the Greek word baptizo, which gives us the English word baptized. And I followed this word up from the 5th century before Jesus Christ to the 1st century A.D. And I could not find a single instance anywhere in which it was used with any other meaning but to immerse. It's used in that meaning both literally 
and metaphorically. That's to say that Jews are people being so immersed in debt that we would say they're head over ears in debt. And it's used of dipping a sponge in water, it's used of bathing people in water, it's used of plunging a sword into a man's neck, and so on. It's used in these various ways, always with one and the same meaning. And I was unable to discover any other meaning. And I, I set out to find out for myself how would a person in the Greek-speaking world in the time of the Apostle Paul naturally understand that word? And I came to the conclusion there was no other natural way that it could be understood, but in the sense of to dip or to emerge. Now, I'm not speaking in any sense to be controversial about the method of water baptism. That's not my topic this evening. It might be another evening. But what I'm speaking about this evening is what does it mean when it says we're baptized in the Holy Spirit? It means we're immersed into the Holy Spirit. Uh, there's a very uh, illuminating phrase used in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. We're speaking about things that happened in the experience of Israel, but which are stated to be patents for us as Christians today, and which were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The Apostle Paul says of the children of Israel, they were all baptized unto their leader Moses in the cloud, and in the sea. The word baptism is used of both experiences, in the cloud and in the sea. What does it mean? You read the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus, you'll find that Israel came out of Egypt, and as they drew near to the waters of the Red Sea, a, a visible cloud of God's personal presence and glory came down over them from above. And first of all, it stood at the head of their army. But when their enemies approached them from behind and pursued them, says the cloud moved over them and stood at their rear. In other words, the whole company of God's people entered into and passed through the visible cloud of God's glory presence coming down over them from above. And that is described as a baptism. Secondly, we read quite clearly that the waters of the Red Sea parted and they went down into and passed through and came up out of the waters. They went down on the Egyptian side, they came up on another side to begin a totally new life with new laws, a new destination, and a new leader. Both these are called baptism. They are clear, symbolic pictures. The cloud is the baptism in the Holy Spirit, God's presence coming down over God's people from above, and they're entering into it, passing through it. The baptism in the sea is a baptism in water going down into the water, passing through the water and coming up on the other side, separated from the life of Egypt, separated from your old foes and enemies, to begin a new life and a new leadership with new laws and a new destination. These are the two baptisms. So we say that, first of all, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is an immersion in that God's personal presence coming down over his people, not, of course, necessarily visible. The, the language that's used in every case where the baptism of the Holy Spirit is described, confirms this. It says either the Holy Ghost fell on them, or the Holy Ghost came upon them, or the Holy Ghost was poured out over them, in every one of those places. Secondly, though, it is a drinking. Jesus said in John 7, verses 37, 38, and 39, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. We see here that the receiving of the Holy Spirit is compared to the act of drinking, by which we receive something into us within, and that same thing springs up and wells forth from us again in rivers of living water. Now you say, which describes the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The answer is both. This is one of those apparent contradictions, like when Jesus said, I am in you, and ye are in me. You say, which is true? The answer is both. You say, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is it an immersion or a drinking? The answer is both. The Holy Spirit comes down over the person. The person receives the Spirit within. The well begins to spring up, and the manifestation flows forth out of the lips. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. First, an immersion. Secondly, a drinking with an overflow. But thirdly, Jesus speaking about this drinking and John interpreting his words says that this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Notice now, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, 
And the word given has been put in by the translators. The Holy Spirit was not yet. Remarkable statement. Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, the gifts of the Holy Spirit could not come till after Jesus was glorified. And that agrees with the words of the Apostle Peter in Acts 2.33. He, Jesus, being by the right hand of the Father exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, hath said forth this, which ye now see in here, after his exaltation at the Father's right hand, he received the Spirit and poured it forth upon the waiting believer, after he was glorified. Now that's an amazing statement which could bear hours of analysis how the Scripture can say the Holy Ghost was not yet when we've read about the Holy Ghost from the second verse of the Bible. For Genesis 1 and 2 says the Spirit of God moves upon the face of the water. What is the difference? And I want to suggest to you very simply it is this. At the day of Pentecost and thereafter when a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit something happens which never happened in any previous age or dispensation. The Holy Ghost was at work in the world. The Holy Ghost moved upon men. The Holy Ghost spake by men. The Holy Ghost clothed men. The Holy Ghost inspired men. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But on the day of Pentecost and thereafter, something more. The Holy Ghost as a person came to indwell individually and permanently the temple of the believer's body. And that had never happened before. The Holy Ghost was not yet in that sense. For well, Jesus said, while I'm here on earth, it can't happen to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And today it is correct to say, Jesus has one and only one divine personal representative acting on his behalf on earth, and that is the Holy Ghost. He is the other comforter. Why did Jesus use the word other? Because he said, I'm the first. When I go, the other will come. Take my place and dwell in you permanently. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as I see it from Scripture, basically, essentially, fundamentally, is these three things. The immersion into the Holy Spirit, the drinking of the Holy Spirit, receiving him within, and the incoming to indwell of a person. Not a thing, not an experience, but a person. The taking up of that person of his rightful place within the individual temple of the believer's body. Oh, yes. He's moved upon that person. He's spoken to that person. He's convicted that person of sin. He's given him repentance. He's created faith in him. He's enabled him to experience the new birth. But there is still something further. The personal indwelling. This is that better thing, never available to the saints of the Old Testament, without which they couldn't be made perfect. This is the Father's promise. Out of 7,000 promises in the Scripture, this is the Father's promise to his children. The Father's promise. The one, above all others, distinct from all others, the incoming of the Holy Spirit. But now listen. Yeah, Pentecostal people, and I'm one of them. I preach to myself as much as I preach to you. True, I was an Anglican, and maybe by some people's standards, I still am an Anglican today. I don't know. But I'm rather an unusual kind of Anglican. I'll have to admit that. Listen, and this is the discovery I've made. You know what? The Holy Ghost is not a dictator. Did you know that? He doesn't come in to issue orders and assert his presence and automatically take complete control. No. He's called the Spirit of Grace. And he's very gracious. And he doesn't push himself. And he doesn't move into areas where he isn't welcome. And he doesn't take more control than you are willing to give. Oh, yes, he's come in. He's manifested his presence. He's given supernatural utterance out of the temple which he's come to occupy. Thereby we know a person was there that wasn't there before, because only a person can speak. But nevertheless, he's still waiting for you to allow him to take over every area of your life. We have got to acknowledge, I don't believe there's any Pentecostal pastor that's been in the ministry five years that would deny what I say. There are many that come to our churches and pray at our altars and receive a very genuine scriptural baptism in the Holy Spirit, speak with other tongues clearly and distinctly as the Spirit gives them utterance. There's no question about that. But we would have to acknowledge that even after this experience, 
there are many areas in those people's lives which have never been given over to God. There's the pastor, I believe, in the Pentecostal movement, that if he was faced with that question, said, what would you answer? He could deny it. It's one of the most heartbreaking experiences. It discourages us. Some people have even lost faith in the baptism of the Holy Spirit because they've seen so little change in some that have had the experience. This is not a matter of question. It's a matter of common knowledge. And I believe our mistaken thinking has been to assume automatically that anybody that had been baptized was necessarily full. I don't believe it. The people in the New Testament that were full produced results. And I can't see how it could be otherwise. Not results that were always what they expected. Stephen produced the most bitter opposition and persecution and became the first martyr. But that was a result. People didn't ignore him. There are people today that have had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is nothing, maybe in the next months or years, that would cause anybody to turn around and look at them twice. My son-in-law in Toronto works in an engineering firm. He's a spirit-baptized young man, been on the mission field. You know, he discovered that in that firm there were seven Pentecostal church members that didn't know one another. There were two that had worked at the next-door benches for two years and never discovered that the other was a member of a Pentecostal church. Can you believe that? But it's a fact. How much impact is that? You say they were filled with the Spirit. They'd had an experience. But they'd never got out of that experience what God intended them to get. And I tell you, there are many like that. And I couldn't doubt but that there are some here tonight. Well, then you'll say, Brother Prince, well, what is fullness? Now, I'm an imperfect human being. I can offer you certain suggestions. If you can improve on them, you go home and do it. What did Paul mean when he said, Be ye continually filled, abounding in the Holy Ghost? Well, as I pointed out this morning, it produces results. It produces results in people's homes and personal relationships. I want to say this again. We today have become very sound in doctrine, as, we, as far as we know it. But very often our doctrine is not related to our character and experience. It isn't translated into personal relationships. I had a young minister in the Pentecostal movement. I only said that it wasn't in the United States. He came to me, his faith was crumbling because of experiences and treatment that he had received at the hand of older ministers. And as he listened to some of the things he told me, I found it shocking. <laughs> you got that tank before the building? Just do something for us for a moment. I'm not ashamed of what I say, but I don't want to create unnecessary trouble. That man came to me, that young pastor, and he said, more or less, he said, really, I don't know what to believe in. I said, brother, you have to acknowledge and recognize the fact that many men, or some men, some men, that have had this experience of being baptized in the Holy Ghost are not necessarily right in their personal relationships, even with their wives. Somebody asked Billy Graham once, I believe, is so-and-so a good Christian? He said, I can't tell you yet, I haven't met his wife. It's a very good answer. What is being filled? Now, as I understand it, just on the basis of language, I've written down here just a brief answer. Being yielded to and possessed by the Holy Spirit in every area of our being. I think I'll say that again. Being yielded to and possessed by the Holy Spirit in every area of our being. Now, this can happen for a short period, even to those that haven't had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Witness the first three cases. 
John the Baptist, his mother, and his father. None of whom ever, well, at least John the Baptist, definitely never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But at a certain period, or over a certain period, in his prophetic ministry, he was filled, and these periods began from his mother's womb. But the tense used indicates that it wasn't necessarily a continuing all the time fullness. He was filled from time to time as the situation demanded. That can happen again. I once had a sister in an assembly of which I was the pastor. I didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. One day she nearly knocked me off my feet because a message in tongues was given and lo and behold she gave the interpretation. <laughs> but I saw, well, how can I tell God not to do that? There's nothing in the Bible that says God mustn't do that. It's the exception. But God is sovereign. He can permit himself exceptions. That was a temporary, particular experience. But the Bible, after the day of Pentecost, and in the Pauline epistles, speaks of being filled in the sense of given over to God, occupied and possessed and controlled by the Holy Ghost, continually. That's the aim and purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now we have to say, as I have mentioned, and I don't believe, if you've gone along with me this far, I believe you have to acknowledge what I say. So many that have been baptized in the Holy Ghost do not have the fullness. I'm not criticizing any experience they have, but they don't have enough. And we come to this question. This is the crisis of my message to you tonight. And I, I, I'm unwilling to preach it to you. In a sense, if I had my choice, I'd preach some other message. But I know what I'm saying is true. What about the unyielded areas? What about them? First, we've got to acknowledge they exist. Then we've got to say, what applies to them? And I say there are two possibilities. One is just plain, uncrucified flesh. The old nature, never dealt with in the way that the Bible says it should be dealt with. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 5, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and love. Notice here that it's the act of the believer. God has made it possible. Our old man was crucified with him by God. But we have got to add our part to God's. And the, the mark of those that are Christ is that they have crucified the flesh. They have willingly taken the place of Christ with Christ on the cross in their fleshly nature, with their affections and lusts. Remember, that's a mark of being Christ. And I would add also that when Christ comes the second time, remember, he's coming for those that are Christ. And I see no reason why we should interpret that phrase any other way, one place than the other. Paul says concerning the order of the, re of the resurrection, Christ the first fruit, then they that are Christ at his coming. Have you noticed that? Not a denomination, but the people that are Christ. And the Bible says, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh, the old carnal nature, with its affections and lusts. This is not something God will do for you. God has made it possible for you to do it, but it remains for each one of us voluntarily to do it in faith ourselves, to put our carnal nature where it belongs, on the cross, where it's dead. And then the Apostle Paul says, reckon yourself to be dead indeed under sin. Now, where God has not been allowed to move in and control, I believe the old nature still remains active, expressing itself in all sorts of ways which are not the will of God. But, over and above that, in these areas that have not occupied, been occupied by the Holy Ghost, there remains a real possibility that some other agent has occupied them an evil spirit. And in many cases, this occupation has endured for many years. And until the Holy Ghost fully comes in, it will continue. In many cases, this particular thing that I'm speaking of began in childhood. And with many people, even from childhood onwards, it's never been dealt with. 
and I call these areas, in my own language, Satan's bridgehead. In our personality. You see, I remember when the war in Korea was on. I don't have a particular knowledge of history, but I just recall that at a certain period, the American forces were on the retreat. And they realized they'd have to evacuate quite a large part of the territory that they'd occupied. But if my memory serves me rightly, they said, we'll hold on to one place, a port called Pusan. And why did they choose a port? Because they said, even if we get out, if we hold this, the way we can get in again. And sure enough, in due course, they got in again. And Satan's tactics are the same. When God moves in, Satan says, well, I'll have to move. I'll have to yield. But if I possibly can, I'll hold a bridgehead. I'll occupy some place. And why? Because it'll be my way back again. And I'm persuaded that there are countless numbers of God's precious children that have never got Satan out of the bridgehead. And I meet them everywhere. In all countries, among all classes of people, and in all denominations. And I do not hesitate. I know for sure that this is true. And if it weren't true, and I weren't convinced of it, I wouldn't dare to say it. And everywhere I've God has given me the grace and the courage to preach this, it has been abundantly confirmed. And I never seek to preach it, except under what I believe to be the impelling of the Holy Ghost. What kind of agent for Satan lead or you. Now mind you, it's perfectly possible that uh, this, these agents can come in later. When a person backslides. At the Full Gospel Businessman's Convention in Denver, Colorado last August, I was giving the Bible teaching as I hope to be doing here. At the end of I think my second Bible teaching message in the afternoon, and it was a Bible teaching message, it was not an exhortatory sermon. A man came forward leading a woman, and he said to me, this woman says she is demon-possessed. Will you pray for her deliverance? Now, I did not go up to that woman and say, sister, you need deliverance. Simply by the exposition of God's word, which is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, she saw clearly her need. And I wrestled, and others stood by me. I thank God they did. It was one of the most terrible cases I've ever witnessed. And I believe in front of many people, there may be one or two here, I don't know. We wrestled for over, I should judge, an hour and a half for that woman's deliverance. And it was not a pleasant spectacle. And that poor soul was in agony of spirit and of body. And when she was through, transpired that she had been a Pentecostal preacher, had known the Lord and exercised the gifts of the Holy Ghost. But she had deserted her husband and adulterously married another man and deserted him and gone over another man. Rather like the woman of Samaria, she was living with the third man when she came to that service. What brought her to the service, I don't know. When she was delivered, First of all, she spoke clearly and fluently in other tongues. And then she even prophesied. But that didn't prove to me she was delivered. The best reason I had for believing that she was delivered was she said, I'm never going back to that man. And we had to look around for a Christian family that would open their home to her because she had nowhere in the world to go. That woman was a backslider, about through deliberate disobedience against the word of God. She opened up wide, and Satan moved in and took over every area he could occupy. And he was not happy to be dislodged. I want to suggest to you just a few of Satan's agents that I have so commonly encountered. One is fear. And in many cases, fear dates back to childhood. And in many cases, fear has never been eradicated. 
by no experience that people have had, neither salvation nor the baptism of the Holy Ghost. In many cases it goes back to unhappiness in childhood, a divided home, parents that quarrel, or some sudden shock. You know, some of the commonest cases of spiritual problems are children that have grown up in a home where Christianity was professed but not practiced in love. Shocking, but it's true. And sometimes it's left tremendously deep scars on the children in those homes. I'll give you an example which isn't exactly like that. My wife and I came in contact with a family consisting of father, mother, and two sons. And partly through our testimony, they came into the Pentecostal experience, one after another. He was quite a well-to-do English businessman. First the mother received, then the father, then the younger son. The elder son was last. One day they said to us, pray with the, young, young, the elder son. As we began to pray with him, it became absolutely plain to us that he was bound by some other spirit. It was pa- apparent in his eyes, it was apparent in his inability to pray, it was as though something was choking him. Well, we prayed for a while, and then we had to leave because we had to take a ferry over a river and the last ferry left at such and such a time. Said to the parents, you have to pray for your child, which is not a bad thing to say to most parents. We didn't meet that boy for about another four days, and then we met the family walking in the street. And I looked at that boy and I said, he's been delivered, hasn't he? And they said, yes. But, they said, we had to pray 36 hours before deliverance came. And when it came, we thought he was dying. That was their own testimony. How did that happen? We discovered. During the Second World War, he was a little boy lying, well, a young boy, lying in bed one night, and he heard there was an air raid overhead, and he heard a bomb falling. Terrifying sound. I don't know how many of you have heard it, but it was common in Britain during the Second World War. It really does. It makes your feet go cold. And you lie there wondering just where it's going to fall. And you know it's not going to be very far away. And as he did this, he, he, lay, he, he lay there and listened to this sound. He did what many people would do. He whipped the sheet over his head. <laughs> Just a kind of instinctive reaction of fear. As he did that, the spirit of fear entered him and took control of him. And he was never free again until he was delivered. And a remarkable thing. Up till that time at school, he'd been pretty good at mathematics. From the moment that that spirit entered him, he lost the ability to do mathematics. And when he was delivered, the ability returned immediately. See, this is quite objective. Just shows you how real these things are. How just areas of a person's personality can be invaded and the other areas left untouched. Another terribly common enemy is resentment. Resentment against the person. And often this is festered and held on in spite of every act of God's grace. It's a bridge to it. Gang, you'll find that these problems occur often in the closest relationships. You'd be surprised how many children, even in Christian homes, bear resentment against their parents. You'd be amazed if the truth came out tonight and everybody's heart was laid bare Another common enemy is depression. It's called in the Bible in Isaiah 61 and verse 3, the spirit of heaviness. Now I know about this because I suffered from it for many years. And I suffered from it after I had been saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit and become a preacher. And I was leading others to the Lord. And my ministry in many ways was owned by God. I had a good reputation amongst my fellow ministers. There was nothing in question in my life as morals were concerned. But I struggled and wrestled against moods of darkness and heaviness and depression that would come over me and bind me and shut me in and make me want to get alone and lock the door and shut people out that seemed to frustrate me when I wanted to do things for God. Unreasonable. And I wrestled with this by prayer, by fasting, by every means that I knew of, but I got no deliverance 
until I saw the identity of the one whom I was struggling with. And one day, while fasting, I read Isaiah 61, verse 3. The garment of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness. And I suddenly saw the spirit of heaviness. It's not yourself you're wrestling with. It's not a mental or a psychological condition you have to deal with. It's a personality directed against you by the enemy of souls, Satan. And you will not get victory until you recognize what you're contending with. See, it's a personality. When I made that one realization, I was 80% of the way to victory immediately. I had to discover one other thing, Joel 2, 32. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. And I called on the name of the Lord, and I want to say I did it explicitly. I didn't pray in a general way, now Lord bless me. I said, Lord, I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm asking now, according to your word, that you deliver me from the spirit of heaviness. And I hit the nail on the head. I hit the enemy on the nose. And he withdrew. Paul said, I fight not as one that beats the air. How much of our Christian living and experience in ministry is beating the air? We're fighting something, but we don't know what it is and we don't know where it is, and our blows don't land. But when we get to see the identity of our enemy and the blows begin to land and the enemy begins to withdraw, desperately needed. And since then, I thank God by his grace, I've been able to bring deliverance from this particular affliction to scores and scores of people. And amongst them can be numbered not a few ministers and missionaries. Because I've observed that this is one of Satan's favorite devices against people that are in the ministry. I have learned also, if I may mention this briefly, that there's a protection. It's one thing to be delivered, it's another thing to stay free. More difficult to stay free than it is to be delivered. God showed me two protections. The first was the one mentioned, the garment of praise. Put on the garment of praise, the spirit of heaviness doesn't like your company. See, if you praise Jesus according to the words of Scripture in faith out of a pure heart, you trouble the devil more than he troubles you. Then he'll find somebody else to trouble. <laughs> I must tell this story. I usually tell it, and I didn't want to, but I feel it could help somebody. We, we had, in London, when we had our work there, there was a lady, a Pentecostal lady, whose husband had been a backslider, got into jail, and come out of jail, and she brought him to us. And she said, I want you to pray for my, my husband. I know he's demon-possessed. So we started to pray. We happened to have with us two Russian Jewesses who had been saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And when these, when these two Jewesses prayed, they didn't bother about what the neighbors thought. And they kind of went to town. Quite annoying. And after a while, this man, this backslider, pulled me aside. He said, I think I'm going. There's too much noise here. And I said, now, wait a minute. It's not you that doesn't like the noise. It's the devil. And he doesn't like the noise because we're praising Jesus. And he can't bear that. I said, now you've got two choices. If you go now, the devil will go with you. But if you stay, the devil will go without you. He said, I'll stay. He did. A few minutes later, the devil left him, and he felt it leave his throat. And he was free to praise the Lord, which he couldn't do before. Now remember, when you praise the Lord Jesus, according to the words of Scripture, particularly reminding the devil of two things, that Jesus is exalted far above all principality and power and might and dominion and may, every name that is named, and secondly, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the devil will find somebody else to bother. And there are plenty of people that don't know how to bother the devil. So he'll not stay around you. Secondly, the Lord showed me that I had to protect my mind. That this was the area of me which was not properly defended. And if you look in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, you'll find that the armor of the Christian includes six pieces, and when the Christian wears those six pieces, he's thoroughly protected from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. But if he omits any piece, he is no longer fully protected. You can see it for yourself. And I realized it was my head, my thought mind, my imagination that were not protected. And I saw there there was one obvious piece of armor, the helmet of salvation. And I thought to myself, well, now what's that? I'm saved. I have salvation. What's the helmet? I thank God I had a Bible with cross-references. There was one cross-reference, which was to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. For a blessed faith, of faith and love, 
and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. You know the key word? Hope. You see, faith is a condition of the heart. Faith and love are found in the breastplate, where the heart is. But there is a condition of the mind, and it's hope. It's an expectancy of good, a continual expectancy of good. And that's the protection of your mind. I believe everybody is born either an optimist or a pessimist. <coughs> I know for sure I was born a pessimist. But God taught me out of his word that as a Christian believer, I could no longer continue to be a pessimist. It wasn't consistent with the profession of my faith. And I thank God, I can testify before you all, and before my wife, which is the person that really matters, God changed that. About 15 years ago, I wouldn't have dared to give this testimony, you know that? Because I'd have been so afraid the devil would come back and make things worse for me. <laughs> but praise God, I'm not afraid tonight. Amen. Mind you, that doesn't mean that we don't have to watch and pray and be on our guard. We surely do. But being fearful is no way to be on your guard. There's another thing that troubles people, and that is lying. What the Bible calls a lying spirit. I used to talk about a spirit of doubt. I don't find one in the Bible, and I don't believe it's correct. The people that doubt, the people that cannot believe their salvation, that cannot get the assurance of salvation, the people that doubt their baptism in the Holy Spirit, you know what they're troubled with? In many instances, if it isn't just laziness, I mean laziness in the sense that they don't take time to study God's Word, if it goes beyond that, if it's something they really cannot overcome, they are tried and tormented with a lying spirit. A lying spirit is a spirit that tells lies, and the Bible is the truth. And anything that's contrary to the Bible is a lie. And these people cannot believe their salvation, cannot believe the baptism of the Holy Ghost, because their minds or their personalities are open to a lying suggestion all the time. is isn't true. You're the exception. It means others. It doesn't mean you. How can you know? You've met people, doubtless, that have had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, spoken in other tongues. They come back a day or two later and they say, you know, I didn't really get it. <laughs> and then they say, see, I just did it myself. Have you ever met people like that? Well, you know what to answer them. This is one of Satan's favorite tactics at the present moment. One out of every three people, I think, that get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they come back with this answer. You know what? to say, when they say, I did it myself, you say, of course you did it yourself. If you didn't do it yourself, the Holy Ghost wouldn't have done it. See, they've got the impression that there's got to be an explosion. The Holy Ghost has got to take over regardless of their will or faith and just force them to speak in tongues. And if not, they've done it themselves. It's wrong. These people are tormented by a lie, by an agent. I had a, a woman come to me in Seattle, Washington about a year ago she came forward for prayer at the end. She said, Sister, what do you want? She said, I've been seeking salvation for two years. Well, that's an extraordinary situation, isn't it? Especially for people that have been under full gospel preaching. You know, I really wasn't reasoning or thinking what I was doing, but I said quite casually, Lord, I bind that lying spirit in the name of Jesus. And within two minutes, that woman had been saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. She became quite one of an, an outstanding convert. All those two years, she'd been held back from assurance by the insinuations of a lying spirit that tormented her mind, created doubt. Many, many are troubled that way. If a person yields to this, it goes further. They become liars themselves. That spirit actually takes over their personality. I remember speaking to a Christian woman once that had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, known well to my wife and myself. And she'd got out of the Spirit in ways that I don't need to enter into. And she was talking to me and I asked her a question. And she said something that was monstrously untrue and obviously untrue. And I said to her in amazement, what did you say? She said, I didn't say anything. And I was just going to get on to her. And I was checked, and I saw it was true. She didn't say anything. The Spirit said something to her. And you can't imagine the trouble that woman caused in the next six months by going around telling lies everywhere. Recently, in the last few months, 
My wife and I came together again. She confessed, and she asked us to pray for her deliverance. It took a good many years before she realized. I want to mention one other thing. I mention it because it's so common. There are in not a few believers an area in their sexual life where they do not have liberty, where they're compelled and controlled by another force. Sometimes it's in thought, in look, or in act. Now, that can be just plain carnality, can just be a refusal to take sides against evil and live for God. But sometimes it's more. Sometimes they are the most sincere people who have experienced salvation and experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and yet nevertheless there's an area in their personal life where they cannot get deliverance. Don't tell me there isn't, because in the last six months, I imagine I have met 30 people from Pentecostal background that have told me this is true in their experience. It's amazing how common it is. Let's face facts. Let's face facts. Now, where a person has had the experience of salvation, and has had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and has been instructed in the Christian life, and really desires with all their heart and soul to live clean and live for God, and then they are not able to do it. Then, I say, suspect satanic bondage. That person needs a definite deliverance, and can have it. Thank God, and can have it. It's available. Now, in closing, what I have to say, I want to deal with two particular points. I don't want to leave Satan in the middle of this stage. First of all, I want to point out to you that God has provided deliverance through three agents. And to have full deliverance, you must have the united working in your life of these three agents. The three agents of deliverance are clearly stated in the New Testament. The first is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You must have personal contact with him. John 8, 36. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. But now, there are those that know the Son of God as Savior, but they do not have freedom indeed. I like that word indeed. Not just in theory, not just as a doctrine, but in real experience, free indeed. Why not? Because there are two more agents. John 8, 32, just four verses higher up, Jesus says, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. In many cases, freedom does not come till we know the truth. We know what God's Word teaches, and we know the truth about our enemy. And I suppose there's probably nothing harder for human beings, actually, than to be fully honest. You see what David said when he had sinned, committed murder and adultery, and thought he got away with it until he was confronted by the prophet Nathan, who showed him that God knew his sin. When he repented and returned to God, he said, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward part, not just in the hand, not just as a profession, but right inside. Do you have that? Do you have that? Are you liberated within? The truth. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3, 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is deliverance. See? All that we know out of the Word of God can be very true and very correct. Our doctrines may be faultless, but it's only the Holy Ghost that makes them experience. We have access to God by one Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And God indwells us by His Spirit. 
Our relationship to God depends on the Holy Spirit. God's relation to us depends on the Holy Spirit. Unless the Holy Spirit has moved into that area of your life, you can have your freedom in name, but not in experience. These three powers, these agents of God, have got to unite in you. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, the truth according to God's Word, which is truth, and the Holy Ghost, which is the agent of liberation. And sometimes that liberation is going to be rather a surprising experience. Let me say only one thing. There do come times in people's experience when they have to choose between deliverance and their own dignity. And if your dignity means more to you than deliverance, sometimes you'll miss deliverance. But the Holy Ghost sometimes works in rather unconventional ways. And you can't tell him not to. What are the conditions for deliverance? They're summed up in one verse, Ephesians 1, 7. Speaking about Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Redemption means we are brought back out of the hand of the enemy. The Bible says we were in the hand of the enemy, but we redeemed by the blood of Jesus out of the hand of the enemy. The Bible says that the redeemed of the Lord say so. You're redeemed, you should say so. You should know it and say it and keep on saying it. But redemption is through his blood. And then the Apostle Paul says, even the forgiveness of sins. In other words, the basis of redemption is the forgiveness of sins. If your sins are fully forgiven, you should have full redemption. You say, Brother Prince, what do you mean by it? I mean, is it just a label? Is it just a theory? Or do you have forgiveness of sins in real experience? Because to have that, you've got to meet God's conditions for the forgiveness of sins. And I have encountered people that had the impression their sins were forgiven. But in the light of God's word, they saw that they were greatly mistaken. Now let me show you the four things that you have to do to make this redemption a reality. First of all, you have to confess your sins. You cannot cover them up. If the Holy Spirit is dealing with anything in your life, you've got to bring it to the Lord, confess it, and he will cleanse it. I've been amazed how long a memory God has got. I'm not seeking to plunge anybody into uncertainty, but I'm dealing with things that I know about. I have met people that deceived their wives years back. And when they came to me for deliverance, God put his finger on that thing, and they could get not one step nearer to God until that was put right, until they'd been fully honest with their wives, with God. It might be the husband. It might be the wife with the husband. Confession, coming to the light, the human soul, when convicted of guilt, shrinks from the light. But you remember that we can only be cleansed in the light. And confession is coming to the light. And this is the wonderful thing. When you bring a thing to the light, the blood cleanses it. You don't have to be ashamed of it anymore. Because it's blotted out. Secondly, renown. Not sufficient to confess, confess your sin if you intend to continue in it. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoso covereth his sin shall not have mercy, but he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall find mercy, shall not prosper, it says. But he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. What a beautiful word, mercy. Is. And the scripture that God brought to me very powerfully as I was preparing for the meeting this evening, and I feel God would have me to read it to you, is Isaiah 55 and verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thought, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Notice the condition for abundant pardoning. Let the wicked forsake his way, 
And further than that, the unrighteous man is thought. Not merely do you have to renounce the act, you have to renounce the thought of the act. You've got to put it out of your thoughts. You're no longer to play with it. You're no longer to chase it in imagination. The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. Not the act, but the thought. As the wicked that wants to come to God for abundant pardon has got to forsake his way and change his thought. Thirdly, if you want forgiveness, you have to forgive. Now that should be obvious, but it needs to be repeated today. You do not get more forgiveness from God than you offer to others. Jesus said that very, very plainly. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, and the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught us what we call today the Lord's Prayer. And he said these words in Matthew 6, verse 12, And forgive us our debt, as we forgive our debtors. And in another version it says, Forgive us those that trespass against us, as we forgive. Uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against. Notice the as. <coughs> God's forgiveness of us is in proportion to our forgiveness of others. And Jesus said immediately after teaching the Lord's Prayer, he said in Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If you forgive, God will forgive. If you do not forgive, God will not forgive. Now there are some of you here tonight that you've prayed and you've worried and you've agonized and yet there remains a shadow cast over your spiritual life, something that troubles and keeps you from complete liberation and complete peace. Do you know what it is? It's an unforgiving spirit. There's someone, just one person, maybe, you couldn't forgive. You didn't forgive. You wouldn't forgive. Jesus said, you remember, there's one person you've got anything against or has anything against you. Don't come and offer anything at the altar. Don't be reconciled. Then come. What a, finally, Joel 2, 32, call. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Whosoever shall call shall be delivered. I'm going to repeat those four steps. Four conditions. Confess, renounce, forgive, and call. It works. The darkness shadow, fear, torment, bondage. You don't need to continue that way. The message of the gospel is a message of deliverance. The title of Jesus Christ is the deliverer. Those that will meet his conditions, he will deliver. So we bow our heads and pray. We thank thee. We thank thee for thy Holy Spirit present in this place. Truly just at this moment we can sense the presence of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of grace, wooing and drawing men and women, showing them their need, creating faith in them to receive that which they need from the hand of Jesus Christ tonight. Bless each one that raised a hand. We plead the blood of Jesus over them. May no satanic device or opposition be permitted to hinder them from drawing nigh to thee with a true heart in full assurance of faith tonight and receiving that which their raised hand indicates they need. Bless this whole congregation. Keep your hand upon us, Lord. Move with us into the after service, and have your way to pr we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>